So this principle becomes extremely important in practice. So for example, suppose you want to look at people who are good players, people who have good batting averages, right? So now suppose we filtered or arranged the data by batting average. So we took batters and then we took, uh, arranged it by descending order of batting average, right? So we want to look at the people who are, uh, who are good, good batsmen, so to say, people who are really good at batting. Right. So you arrange it by descending order of BA. Right. So you would think that's that will help you to find uh, the people who are good players. But if you see the results comes out like this. Right. Of course, there are 18,659 rows. But if you look at the data, the top people have high batting averages. In fact, they all have batting averages of one. But of course, they've also played just once or twice. Okay. They've not played too many times. Right. So which means that uh, these could just be fluke occurrences. They didn't play too many times. They just happened to get a couple of hits and those few hits, they turned out to be good, right? This is as opposed to people who have been at bat, you know, 5,000 times, 6,000 times and still have batting averages which are uh, comparatively high, okay? So that's the importance. You need to, don't consider just the absolute values. Look at the corresponding sample because at lower sample sizes, the variability is going to be huge. Right. So although these are people who had one at bat and had a batting average of one, there are many, many, many people who have had low at bats and have uh, very low batting averages, maybe zero. Okay. So that's the point that's being made here. Okay. So there are many functions that you can use while summarizing. So for example, while summarizing, for example, if you want to consider the average of all the positive delays only, right? So when you had the delays, some of the delays are negative for flights that came in early and some are positive. But suppose you want to average only the positive delays and leave out the negative ones. Right? So then you can use the function like this. So not cancelled. Uh, we took the not cancelled data, uh, the table, which we already created. Group it by year, month and day. And while doing summary, we are looking at uh, average delay 1, which is the mean of arrival delay and average delay 2 which is the mean of arrival delays, but only the mean of arrival delays that are greater than zero. Okay, so we are we're doing arrival delay of arrival delay greater than zero. Okay, so what this does is it for the for mean for computing the mean, it's only considering the values of arrival delay that are positive uh, or zero, right? Or in fact, greater than zero, not even zeros. Okay, so obviously the results will be quite different between the two things. Uh, now, we can look at the st standard deviations, you know, while summarizing, you can also do the mean. We've only done mean so far. We've done the count by using n, but we can also do standard deviations. So, for example, uh, we took the not cancelled flight, we grouped by the destination, and then uh, we want to find the distance of the destinations, the, the standard deviation of the distance, right? So, uh, if you do this, you will find that for some of the destinations, the standard deviation happens to be higher than for other destinations, right? Why is this the case? Probably because when you're going short distances or relatively short distances, then the route that you take is probably mostly the same or very close to the same. Whereas when you're going long distances, the routing may be fairly different. And that is why the standard deviation for those destinations could be different. Okay, so let's just... Uh, as a, a guess, once again, through data exploration, we can actually find out. Some, uh, so now we can use uh, other, so for example, we showed here the use of the standard deviation or SD function while summarizing. Okay. Now sometimes we may want to find when do the first and last flights leave for each day. So once again, we're taking the not cancelled flights, grouping by year, month, day, and then summarizing, uh, we are doing uh, the minimum of the departure time and the maximum of the departure time, which will tell us the first and last flights. Okay, a minimum departure time, maximum departure time. So we can use the min and max functions also while summarizing. In fact, you can use any function that computes and produces one value. Okay, so whatever that is. Or you could also do the same thing by using uh, first and last functions. Okay, now the first and last functions simply literally tell you, given an array, what is the first value, what is the last value, okay? So the first and last, not in terms of minimum and maximum, but on this data frame, it works 
because uh, the data is completely sorted by uh, departure time. Right? That is why this first and last work. But first and last you can generally use. Okay, Which destinations have the most carriers? So you can do this group by destination and then uh, you can use the function n distinct carrier, right? Like unique. If you remember, we had unique. Unique tells you the actual values. N distinct simply tells you how many distinct values are there, the count of the distinct values, as opposed to the actual distinct values which unique provides. Okay, so you do that. We uh, did not cancel, we grouped it by destination, summarized that uh, table by uh, you know finding out for every distinct carrier how many different carriers there are, and then arrange it by descending order of carriers. Okay. This is a good example of how piping can be so useful to write complex computations, but uh, by doing it step by step by step and piping the results, it becomes so easy. Okay, so obviously it looks like Atlanta is the one that has most carriers, uh, and of course many others, Boston, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so counting is such a common operation that there is a shortcut for counting. Right, so you can just say not cancel count destination. Okay, so that tells you uh, directly. Uh, for every destination, how many records were found, how many rows were found. So it looks like uh, you've got this count. Of course, we didn't order it. So clearly, uh, you know, it's not sorted in any way, but you can also see that Atlanta is one of the big numbers. We still don't know that it is the maximum, uh, but it could be. Right? So if we uh, arranged it and then saw the result, then you would actually see which one is maximum. Arrange it by descending uh, order of the count. Okay, but we didn't store any of that here. <coughs> you can also do weighted counting. For example, uh, let me show the first thing. Okay, so we've got cancel, not cancel. We've counted it by tail number. Okay, that is for every specific aircraft pin number, how many flights did it fly? Okay, but uh, this is just giving you how many flights it took, right? Because you're only counting the number of occurrences. On the other hand, you can weight this by the distance to find out the total distance flown by each aircraft. So we said to count tail number, weight equals distance. Okay, of course, it's the same as uh, summarizing and summing the weight. That would be uh, uh, summing the distance. That would be exactly the same thing. But you could uh, uh, weight it by the distance. That is, uh, every time it flies, there is a distance that it flew that becomes the weight. Right? So it's a weighted count. Uh, essentially, it will total up the values. Okay. Now, counting of logical values is also a useful trick. So here, take a look at this example. Uh, we've taken the not cancel flights, grouped it by year, month, and day. Right? And we want to find out for each day how many flights were early, how many flights reached early for that particular day. So we're saying sum of departure time less than 500. Right. So now, uh, early flights in the sense of not reached early, but flights that took off before 5 a.m. Okay, that's why departure time less than 500. Okay, so that is departure time was between uh, midnight and 5 a.m. That's what is an early flight. Okay, so now some departure time less than 500. Now, departure time less than 500 is either true or false. Right. So the result of this departure time less than 500 is really just a Boolean array. True, false, true, false, true, false. So if departure time is less than 500, it's going to be true. Otherwise, it's going to be false. Now, what do we mean by summing up true, false values? Now, in R, when you sum up Boolean values, it treats true as one. Okay. So effectively, every time there is a flight which left before 5 a.m., it will get added up. So effectively, you're going to get the total number of flights that left before 5 a.m. Right? So adding up or summing up Boolean values is a useful trick for counting. Okay? So now uh, uh, we, we can also find out uh, how many flights were had an arrival delay or what proportion of flights had an arrival delay more than one hour. Okay? So that's what this is doing. So group by again, summarize our percentage. We are taking now, instead of adding up the total of the departure time less than 500 of Boolean values, 
we are now taking the mean of the Boolean values, right? The mean would take true as one, false as zero. And if you take the average, effectively, you're going to get the proportion. Right? Think about that. So that's what is happening. So you're able to count uh, what percentage of flights were delayed by more than one hour. Now, just like we did with our uh, earlier example of employees, you can actually group by multiple values and then you can roll out the grouping one by one. So here we are doing, again, uh, grouping the flights by day, year, month, and day. And then we are doing per day is summarize daily flights equals n. Right? Remember this, when you use the n function, you're getting the count. How many rows satisfied that condition? Right? So here what you're going to get is for every year, month, day combination, uh, you're going to get how many flights went on that particular day. Okay, so that uh, gives you this result. And of course, it says with 355 more rows, because total of 365 rows, you're seeing 10 rows here. So that makes sense. Now, what we are doing is we are taking the per day and summarizing it again. But this time we are summarizing it. Uh, we are summarizing the flights variable, right? Because the count for each day, we stored the value in the variable called flights. So that's what we are now adding up summarize per day, right? This is the result of the previous operation and we are summing up the number of flights on each day. So what's going to happen is that you're going to get the number of flights per month because the data is year, month, day, right? So the day summarization we've already done, the next level of summarization will automatically happen on the, on the month, okay? As I had already told you, when you do this summarization, it rolls out one level of summarization, which means the grouping by day is now gone, right? So the resulting data is grouped by year and month. So when you summarize that, you now get the per month values, okay? So now you can see here, there are obviously 12 results because there are 12 months in the year of 2013 and you get for each month, how many flights went. Now you can summarize it again and get the total number of flights for the whole year. That's what is happening here, right? So you're summarizing now the per month and again, summing up the flights because you called the summarized result as flights, right? So flights equals some flights. Right? So now you get the result, which is, of course, this is the total number of rows. So it seems to be correct.